I, Steve gave a great and thought-provoking um, introduction to this, and I thought that I'd give you a little bit about past, but past is past, and then give you a little bit about what we're doing right now. Uh, and then we had, fortunately, our kind of annual um, PGT Jamboree conference just a couple of weeks ago in Geneva, which was a, a good way to get some of the latest data. So I'll present some of the latest data from that conference in Geneva. Uh, and then later on, if you guys are still awake after the break, I get out my crystal ball and I give a little bit of crystal ball gazing as to where we might be in the future and try not to scare you about where genetics could go. So, this is exactly the same as Steve. Um, the thing that I'm going to talk about is the aneuploidy screening, PGTA, because that's actually uh, where things are developing at the moment. Um, PGTM, the monogenic disease, disease testing, PGD, not really going to talk about. Um, but just to recap, PGTA, it's chromosome screening. You're counting embryos for the right numbers of chromosomes. That's the simplest way of thinking about it. And the premise is simple. If you have an embryo with the right number of chromosomes, it's more likely to implant and make a healthy live birth than one with the wrong number of chromosomes. How we get to as much controversy as we do in the UK about that uh, is, uh, is a good question. But that's the simple premise. Um, is it an option for all IVF patients? Well, that's certainly up for debate. Uh, does it improve IVF success rates? I won't really... Um, Go, dwell on that too much because we could have a whole lecture about that but there are quite a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials and papers that we can discuss about that so it's a genetic test and it's a genetic test uh, aimed to try and improve IVF outcomes what you have to remember is it doesn't improve embryos all you're doing is doing a different way of selecting those embryos for transfer the first time. If you had a cohort of five embryos and you transferred every one in sequence, you would have the same outcome as if you uh, transferred one and then did a selection and then transferred the next one, except you'll end up with multiple miscarriages and you might have um, a, poor, a poor experience for the patient in between. So we're trying to improve, to select the embryos first time that are most likely to result in a healthy live birth. It provides uh, the patients with information about the chromosomal health, which is a bit of an American term, I must say, of their embryos. Um, and hopefully, it improves pregnancy outcomes. So, I have been in this field um, not quite as long as our esteemed speaker from before, uh, for just over 10 years. And the field of PGTA has been going since the early 90s. And this is when we used to do a technique called FISH, which was, I don't know whether anybody's there, you used to do FISH and you had to spread embryos and you had to, you, you had to count chromosomes. And I did this in an, uh, a sort of academic research. Uh, and it's still used in oncology, and it's great for oncology, where you have hundreds of cells to count. But where you have one cell to count, eh, not, maybe not the best technique. And then, uh, about uh, ooh, 20 years ago now, we changed to another technique, which was uh, metaphase CGH. And this was a lovely technique if you were a cytogeneticist like I am, where you painted DNA onto chromosomes. And it was fantastic. It was also incredibly labor intensive. You had to be an expert cytogeneticist. And it was terrible to analyze. But it was, uh, it was the first time that we were able to look at all chromosomes, which is kind of interesting. Then when I came into the field was about 2008. I don't know if any of you remember a company that's now in the dim and distant past called Blue Gnome. Did anybody hear of them? They, that was a company that we were with. And our kind of claim to fame, where we were the first people to be able to look at a single cell and analyze that single cell and really count the chromosomes uh, to a certain extent. And we did our first single cell um, case back in 2008. And that was the first time that anybody used real good counting technique for PGS. And then we move on, and you can see, the other thing you can see is things are speeding up. So, you know, from 93 to 99 to 2008, 2014, this is when we introduced next generation sequencing. And 
Next generation sequencing has this great kind of like, wow, we're sequencing embryos for every base pair, isn't it? Sort of, you know, brave new world. It's not that at all. And without going into it in too much details, it's a really good way at counting chromosomes very accurately. So we count chromosomes very accurately using DNA sequences, which has its flip side, because the more information you find, the more questions you find. And now we've got new questions that we have to address, mosaicism. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how we're changing things here, which is using AI to try and improve our analysis. And the aim of that is then to try and improve your outcomes for your patients. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is we've moved from doing polar body on day three, which was the first, to doing day five um, and vitrification. The thing I think we all really like is that um, there, there's Leone at the back. Leone, will you put your hand up? Leone is our lab director, and we used to do the, um, we used to do the day three uh, biopsy, and then next day results. You probably all remember that from the day three biopsies. Absolute nightmare for the lab. But importantly, you've gone from one cell to five cell. And actually, it doesn't sound very much, but actually we can do a far better genetic test on five cells than we could on one cell. So just a couple of quick historical slides. So I'm going to show you a few of these profiles. So I'll, I'll tell you about them to start off with if you've never seen one before. This is a linear view of a genome. So it starts off, for those of you at the back who probably can't see, this is chromosome one, two, three, four, five, along here. And this is X and Y. Basically, uh, <laughs> this is really old data. This is from 2008, so this is like, you know, sort of ancient history in genomics terms. Um, ooh, and I'm moving it. That's weird. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'll try not to move it now. Ooh. <laughs> it's kind of disturbing when you close up to it like that. <laughs> I'm feeling sort of slightly seasick. Um, yeah. The line in the middle, if it's, if it's in the middle, you have two copies of every chromosome, so that's normal. And if it goes above the line, you have three copies of a chromosome, and below the line, one copy of a chromosome. So above the line, it's a trisomy. Below the line, it's a monosomy. And this was the first time that we got a single cell to work to show a gain and a loss. And this was a cell line, single cell, which had a trisomy 12 and a monosomy 14, which if you squint, you can see this. And I was telling the others, I went down the pub with this, and showed my friends, and I went, look at this, this is amazing. They all thought, you know, the boys lost it here. But it was, it was I remember it as a sort of seminal moment. And then uh, when we first started doing this, polar bodies was, you know, what we thought was the least invasive thing to work on. And this was the very first case that we did with care fertility. And this was a lady who'd had 14 previous failed IVF cycles. It was last chance saloon. And we now look back upon it and go, oh my god, did we really call this? And this particular embryo, embryo two, still remember it? This was the only one out of eight embryos that was normal. And she transferred that. And she ended up with a little boy, baby Oliver. At that point, we had n equals one experiments, and we thought this is the way. And you know, you always find out about it later on. But it was a really interesting time to be doing this kind of stuff. The thing that really sort of I was thinking about the history and how things have changed is really the data that we get. Back in Fish, that was three data points, three chromosomes, is what we were working on. Then we thought it was great. We got to seven chromosomes. And then finally, we got to 24 data points, 24 chromosomes. That was really, really pushing the boundaries back in 2000. When we started, 3,000 data points. Once you've got more data points, you can analyze things more extensively. And as you can see, we're now about half a million data points from sequencing. That's why we can count chromosomes much better. And in the future, the only way this trend is going is more data. And it's how you interpret how you use it, and how it works in clinical practice is going to be the fun bit. So the things that we didn't know back then that we know now. So this is, um, I think, when I added it up, it was about 55,000 embryo biopsies that we used to get this graph. And this graph is fairly simple. And it is, this is 
uh, euploid embryos with maternal age in green, aneuploid in blue, and mosaics in purple. And it's fairly obvious now, but it wasn't really when we were doing this stuff back then. 36 and a half, if you divide it slightly. Over 36 and a half, more than 50% of the embryos are aneuploid. So it becomes a sort of 50-50 at that point if you don't do a selection of some sort. And you might use time lapse, you might use PGTA. In the future, you might use them both together. The other thing, which is our new little discovery to add things and make things a bit more difficult, is the purple, which is mosaics, which I'll come on to later. But certainly, you know, with advanced maternal age, you know, your odds become stacked of trying to find a euploid. So what can we use it for now? What's the technology? So it tells us really well aneuploidy. So if we just think back to aneuploidy, there's two types of aneuploidy. There's meiotic aneuploidy that comes from the egg and sperm, and there's post-mitotic, which comes from errors after uh, fertilization. The thing that we're really, really good at is meiotic aneuploidies. These are full chromosome changes. And that's why we do thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And it's incredibly rare when somebody rings us up and says, for instance, we have had a miscarriage, and the miscarriage has a genetic trisomy, and we didn't see it. So it's really good, and it has an extremely low false negative. That's good. It will detect parts of chromosomes that are gained or lost, segmental aneuploidies. Um, Translocations for structural rearrangements, that's good. Um, polyploidy, so currently we can detect male polyploids, so that's triploids, male triploids, and we're working hard on being able to do full analysis of polyploidy. And then the new one, so you have all this new technology, and it's like everything, you find some new technology, it brings you new questions, and mosaicism is the question that it's brought up. And we'll tell you a little bit about how, now how we're using AI here. So this is the typical presentation slide that people use in a talk, because it's beautiful. And with two minutes explanation to a student coming out of university or coming out of college, if this is in the middle, it's two chromosomes. If it goes over the green line, it's three, and the red line, one, and you can tell that this is a normal female. This, because it has one copy of X, one copy of Y, is a normal male. So of course, what we don't do in the UK is we don't tell you anything about this bit unless there's a, a sex chromosomal abnormality, but we see this all the time. So we have to be really careful not to report it. But this is beautiful, and it's a bit like being an embryologist. I know nothing nothing about embryology, but I could probably tell you at a pinch the difference between a, whatever your top grade is, an AA embryo, and whatever your grade is, the bottom, I don't know, D or something like that. I could probably tell you, but the bits in between, complete mystery to me, and I've been to tons of embryology labs, and it's just like, they look the same. And that's subjectivity, and that's where experience comes in. And what we've been doing is, these are the beautiful ones, but there's always a certain amount of subjectivity and analysis that we've had to apply to these. And this is when it becomes subjective. So we can see that it's about normal, but is this noise, is this a mosaic change? So is it part way change, or is it real? And this is when you have to get analysts to go in and look at these things, a bit like grading. You have to go through it. And I used to say, it's the optimists and pessimists. And you could see the people in the lab who are optimists and pessimists. Because some people were just a little bit, I think that one I can call euploid, and others were like, oh, no. So what we've been trying to do is get away from subjectivity and just use maths and AI to call these. And again, another one. Is this chromosome 7 real change, or is it not? So the software that we had, 
was great. And it would call certain things automatically. So this is um, how the software used to work. And you can see that it's called part of chromosome 9. Yep, it's great. But it's missed here, part of chromosome 1 that's deleted. This is a translocation. So we know it's a 1-9, so we know it's real. So the software wasn't doing the, the perfect job. Again, it didn't call this one, because it's not got a green line here. And it didn't call this one, and it hasn't called this. So our software that we had wasn't quite fit for purpose. So what we have now is we have these super high-tech sequencers. Each sequencer will take our samples of our biopsies, and we get uh, tens of millions of what we call DNA sequence reads from them. And then we used to just plot them into these charts and call the charts. But now we have a model, an AI model, that runs this and automatically generates reports. So there's very little of the analysts sitting down and looking at it. And it's a bit like the, whatever is, KIP, KIP scores from embryoscopes. Yeah, it's a bit like this. So we're trying to take away subjectivity and use maths to give the calling. So it also reduces risks because it actually writes down what then goes into the report. So your reports look identical as they always have done, but it's actually a uh, mathematical model that will tell you that it's euploid or it's got 47 chromosomes and gained a chromosome 10. So we don't actually have to write things, and it reduces their risks of transcription errors. Um, the other thing we've been able to do is change what we call the truth. So whenever you're using AI, you have to put a model of what is truth and what is not truth. Actually, this is all really interesting, all really interesting, but what is the benefit to you guys? So the benefit that we are beginning to see is it improves accuracy. If it improves accuracy, we call more euploids, and we call less aneuploids, because we can be more certain that something is euploid. Hence, actually, what we're finding is you have more embryos to transfer. And that's the main improvement, because those things that were difficult to call were more black and white now, less gray. And uh, you actually probably use AI all the time, iPhones, Alexa. Slightly scary, because apparently in Alexa, they record everything that you say. So, <laughs> but, you know, it does have its benefits. And it, you, it requires big data to, all, to get this to work. And that's why now we have millions of data points. We can just use statistical modeling to call things. Uh, the other thing, just to, re just to say, we have a complete version control. So we always keep every result which is also another benefit of kind of AI, and we keep everything in the cloud. So we're using our big data in this space. We're using stats. We're automating it. The thing that we did really differently here is we thought about, actually, what is our truth data? And we took 1,000 embryo biopsies that resulted in a healthy live birth, and we said, actually, that is what defines a euploid. It's not just what we've seen, it's actually outcomes. And that's been a big difference from what we did before. Uh, and then some poor guys in Houston went through and counted, I think it was around 10,000 embryos that we used with our old software and this new software to see how they combined. Um, so we had things that we knew were euploids, and then we think things that we knew were aneuploids. Um, and things that we knew were mosaic. And that's how we developed our model. So what it does now, without getting too techy, this horrible picture, it just used mathematics. So it just looks and counts. And you can't see it at the back there, but it produces the karyotype straight away. Your reports look identical. It will just say, uh, you know, euploid, or it'll say aneuploid and it'll color code it. Looks absolutely identical. But there's a whole lot of science behind it now. So one of the things that it's done is it's given us this whole bunch of information about mosaicism, because it's given us a kind of sensitivity that we didn't have before. 
Steve had a quote from Alan Handyside. I should have had my Alan Handyside quote. <laughs> I'm missing out. Version two of this talk will have the Alan Handyside quote. So Alan, his quote is, we've always been transferring mosaic embryos. Who knows? Louise Brown could have been mosaic. We don't know. Now we can see it, we can't unknow it. So, you know, we know that a percentage of embryos are mosaic, but it's always been. We're not doing anything different. So what is a mosaic embryo? So this is a euploid. So this, every cell has 46 chromosomes. It's normal. This is a clonal aneuploid. Say it has 47 chromosomes, uh, a gain of chromosome 10. Every one of these cells will have that grain, gain of chromosome 10. A mosaic is where you have a, a mixture of two or more cell lines. So you have euploids and aneuploids mixed in. Um, and there's quite good evidence that quite a lot of us have low-level mosaicism. And that's as people do these million genome studies. It does start you looking at people and going, a mosaic? Yeah. But that's, it. that's the science nerd part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in Geneva and everybody in our, uh, our um, PGT geek meeting was there and we were looking at mosaicism and this was a really nice study done by um, some people that we've collaborated in the past with um, Genoma in, uh, in Rome and they had a study where they'd taken 2,000 couples and they looked for euploid, aneuploid, and they looked for mosaicism. So when you do something and you report it, it's, it's, um, it's data. When somebody else does it and reports it and has the same findings and you can do it reproducibly in different places, it becomes science. And what is happening is we've started off with data of mosaicism. Now people are reporting the same things from different labs in different places and reporting the same data. So their 10% is spot on where we are with our 10% mosaicism. So that means one in 10 embryos in their cohorts were mosaic. And what they did is they transferred these mosaic embryos and looked at the outcomes. And this is just the new field of transferring mosaic embryos. And I know there have been some mosaic embryo transfers in the UK. Does anybody know that they've had any mosaic embryo transfers? Yeah, yeah. And I know at least one baby that's been born after a mosaic transfer. Was the baby healthy? Yes, fine. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Which chromosome was it? 19. 19, okay. So 19 is an interesting one because you can never have a live birth of 19. So it's quite a safe one to do, and we have recommendations for transfer. So they have divided up their mosaicism to low level and high level. So low level, more than, less than 50% of the cells have aneuploidy. High level, more than 50% of the cells have aneuploidy. And you see a reduction in life birth rate, biochemicals, and an increase in miscarriage with more mosaicism. So it's an interesting kind of functional evaluation of the genetics. So the genetics says this biopsy has more cells that have the wrong number of chromosomes. They have a worse outcome. And interestingly, none of this is significant, but there are some beginning to see some slight trends, the mosaics having things like low birth weight and preterm birth. But that's what you would expect from when you do CVS, because in CVS you see mosaics in CVS and they have slightly poorer outcomes as well. They can still result in a, in a healthy live birth, but it's always a little bit more difficult conversation. Unfortunately, we have genetic counselors and things like that, so I don't have to have that conversation. Uh, what we did as well in our, our conference they combined all the data that's been published so far, which is a measly 372 cases. So I don't know, we're two, 2 million IVF cycles a year or something like that. 
at the minute, something like that. So I haven't even worked out the percentage. It's way less than 1%, isn't it, that is actually being done with transfer and outcomes. So this is really at the beginning of this. But if you look at ongoing pregnancy birth of mosaics versus euploids, they don't do as well. But they can still result in a healthy live birth. So it's a really interesting uh, area that will keep me in a job and keep us discussing genetics for a long time into the future. Here, if you want it, and we don't force you, you can define whether you want mosaicism calling or not. What we do is we recommend it because the science is beginning to show it. But we will report whether it's normal, a low-level mosaic, a high-level mosaic, or every cell is aneuploid. And the reason why we split these up is because the low levels are now beginning to show that they do better than the high levels. So we're trying to give you that information. And what we're trying to do is where these might have just been called aneuploid in the past, we're trying to give you the best chance of finding something to transfer. So there are a whole bunch of benefits, which is a, a talk in itself of uh, PGTA. Um, so if you can find a euploid, and that's always the problem with advanced maternal age because there's very few, you can do as well as a younger mother. Implantation success rates improve. Um, the miscarriage data is really, really clear that you get a reduction in miscarriage. Uh, it, in got, it, it enables better ongoing pregnancy rates. However, it doesn't improve embryos. And if you imp implanted every embryo in sequence, you would have the same outcome as if you did PGTA. And I think that's my little talk through the past and the present of where we are, and I'll come back on later and give you a little bit of crystal ball gazing. Thank you.